All right. Well, uh, uh, I became interested in artificial intelligence before I became interested in computers. This was in 1949, and there was this symposium at Caltech on uh, cerebral mechanisms and behavior, the so-called Nixon Symposium. And uh, there were various big shots there, von Neumann and uh, McCulloch, and uh, psychologists and physiologists. And at that time, I was thinking about, or began to think about artificial intelligence from the point of view of special purpose computers. And, uh, however, this was by no means my main activity since I was a graduate student in mathematics, and went to Princeton as a graduate student in mathematics, and felt that these ideas were too um, indefinite, although I continued to think about them uh, for serious thesis work uh, at that time. I showed some ideas to von Neumann who said, write them up, write them up. Um, but they weren't good enough and I didn't write it up. And um, I had taken, heard, listened to some lectures on computers at Caltech at that time, which were actually, uh, I remember the exercise was to program divide for the SWAC, which was a computer which was uh, going to appear. Uh, I don't think I understood it very well, or if I did, I forgot. Um, because I don't think, well, there wasn't any SWAC to try it out on anyway. There yeah, was maybe. eventually, wasn't there? What? There was eventually. Sure, there was yeah. eventually, but there wasn't at the time these lectures were given. Uh, at least we certainly weren't offered uh, that opportunity. My first actual contact with computers, well, let's see, then I thought some more. The first time I spent uh, full time on artificial intelligence was in the summer of 52 at Bell Labs. Uh, where Minsky and I were hired by Shannon. And uh, again, I was interested in artificial intelligence and machines were doing it, but paid no attention to computers. <coughs> uh, Bell Labs at that time had IBM 603 or 4, which were calculating punches. And again, no one thought that computers had much to do with it. Now, the one person who already had expressed the view that computers were the key to artificial intelligence was Turing, who had written this article, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, that was published in 1950. But I can't find anyone who uh, interested in artificial intelligence who had read that article, uh, with the exception of Selfridge, who claimed he'd read it but didn't believe it. Uh, at least his approach towards artificial intelligence was... Uh, com was computers. Now, um, I became convinced first that, that computers were the key to artificial intelligence in 55. And at that point, the idea of time sharing was immediately apparent uh, to me because, uh, being as I was thinking about artificial intelligence already, the question was, well, how are you going to interact with it? Uh, was the was the key question, and therefore the idea that one should be sitting comfortably in one's office uh, <clears throat> and interacting with the computer rather than in, rather than thinking of it as a point as as people did at that time for of computation is that you have this computation that you wanted to do and you got a program to run this computation and you ran the computer so. The interactive use was, uh, was the immediate uh, notion to me. And so then I began to look around and talk to people and was very surprised that that wasn't what everybody thought. Uh, and uh, now... When was that, John? 55 or thereabouts. Uh, but uh, I was not in a position to do anything about it. I was at Dartmouth at the time, went back to Dartmouth and didn't actually do anything until I came to MIT as a Sloan Foundation fellow in uh, 57. And uh, at that point, I became interested in trying it out. And uh, because I was quite unself-confident about hardware, I wanted to propose the minimum modification. And I proposed to Dean Arden, 
who was, I believe, director of research or whatever it was for the computation center yeah, at that time. Right. Uh, since I was a visitor at MIT, also my, uh, I was very diffident about uh, things, uh, that uh, we installed uh, a switch on the IBM 704 that would allow it to be put into trapping mode from the outside. Uh, and also uh, install uh, equipment to allow six lines from a flexor rider to take the place of the sense switches, uh, to be put in parallel with the sense switches. So uh, I think I'll stop at this point, which sort of speak gets me up to the kind of the beginning of the idea. Yes, uh, it does, John, but, with but you, uh, let me push you right back to the beginning because you didn't tell us how you got interested in artificial intelligence and what, even before you were in Oh, this college. lesson symposium, I was <coughs> about it before uh, the ideas of uh, computing and um, of machine intelligence were discussed by the various speakers at the Hickson Symposium in 1949. So, but where were you at the time? I was a graduate student at Caltech. Well, that's the... Uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. And okay. what was your subject? Mathematics. Uh -huh. What particular aspects of mathematics? Uh, functional analysis, I guess. But I was just beginning. Yeah. Did yeah. you... And where did you come from? Where were you born and where did you grow up? Oh, all right. I was born in Boston. Uh -huh. And... We moved, started moving across the country when I was about eight or nine. I think we got to California when I was ten. So I went to high school, to the later grades of school from the sixth grade on in California and went to Caltech as an undergraduate. Stayed there for one year of graduate work and then went to Princeton where I got my PhD. And then I might as well finish it off, so to speak. I stayed at Princeton for two more years as an instructor, then went to Stanford. Uh, and uh, then went to Dartmouth, uh, and then went to MIT, first as a Sloan Foundation fellow, and then as an assistant professor uh, of like. communication sciences in the EE department. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> that was essentially because the math department couldn't take more than one computer specialist, so Marvin Minsky was there. Right. Of course, Marvin eventually moved to the electrical engineering yes. department also. Well, this has sort of the aura of this is your, your life, uh, <laughs> which I'm going to try to telescope to the relevant parts. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the, uh, I think the thing that I didn't realize it at the time, but probably the most, one of the key episodes of my <coughs> origins was uh, during World War II when I was uh, still in high school and facing the inevitability of being drafted. And uh, I was I actually rushed through high school and gotten into UCLA for a while. And uh, Navy, I somehow got uh, approached the Navy recruiting office. And they offered me this tempting opportunity to do something interesting while in the service rather than just become kind of a an ordinary soldier. And the, the, the thing they offered was the Eddy program, which turned into uh, for electronic technicians. Cool. And so I enlisted, thinking that was at least more interesting. And indeed, after a year of training, I became an electronic technician. And in the process, so I basically had a, a high school background. And in the process, uh, got exposed to working with uh, all the large electronic systems which were developed in World War II, which were radar, sonar, uh, Loran, uh, and on and on. Most of them I didn't realize at the time were developed here at the Rad Lab at, at MIT, but uh, so that was a later connection. But what I got out of that was something that I realized afterwards, was working with large systems which one didn't fully comprehend every module's purpose, one had a very strong sense of the interfaces and modularity and functionalities that were expected out of all the boxes. So that turned out to be a, an important piece of background to me. I, After the war, I was able to uh, use the GI Bill, and uh, that helped finance going to Caltech as, a, as an undergraduate, where I, uh, along with most of the uh, other 
hot shots in the class uh, thought physics was his thing to do, and so I got into physics. And from there I went on to graduate school here at MIT, uh, starting as, as a physicist, and I can still remember uh, Phil Morse one day calling me into his office and saying, how would you like to be a research assistant on a, a new kind of project we have? Uh, which is a, since I forget the exact title, but it was basically a, a computational uh, assistantship, uh, multidisciplinary, so that there were people from many departments. Uh, but I was one of the early ones there. And so I signed up for that, and in the process, in the summer of 51, uh, began to learn about computing equipment, ranging from punch cards to a whirlwind. And Whirlwind was just beginning to roll in uh, those days. And in fact, I think when we first began to take uh, lessons or instruction on it, they had maybe 256 18-bit words. <laughs> and it was still, ex every month it was expanding by a factor of two, which uh, more or less. Well, the parity check every two minutes, right? Yeah, yeah, maybe two, maybe six, but not more than 20. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, these were using those uh, Williams. Tubes. Those no, they weren't Williams tubes. They were special designed. Uh, that was, in fact, that's what distinguished Whirlwind. They had a, their own design of tubes, which made them slightly more reliable than the, than the Williams tubes. But that that was a very pivotal exposure because, in fact, I ended up doing my doctoral work on molecular physics primarily because it was. Uh, it required a lot of extensive calculations, and in fact, somewhere in that period, in the mid-50s, I began to get more interested in the computational aspects than I was in the physics. And so, after I got my degree, Phil Morse approached me again, this time because he had been organizing the start of the computation center at MIT in '56 which was to acquire a gift from IBM of an IBM 704. So I signed on as a staff member and assistant director for uh, his responsibility for uh, the, the research assistantship program that was one of the things that also went with the center. And in the process continued to try to do some physics research involving computation on molecular diatomic molecules. but. I experienced in that period the uh, an observation that computers were getting tougher and tougher to get at as people got became to realize they were they were useful and interesting. So the queues kept getting longer and longer, and it was harder to debug programs in the old batch processing style. Computation centers were getting more and more obsessed with trying to be more efficient, and the users were getting squeezed out, and debugging was getting harder and harder. And that was another important piece of background because it was quite clear that it was getting harder and harder to write programs and to get things done. <coughs> and I guess it was about that time, shortly after the center began, uh, John showed up on the scene. And uh, <coughs> my recollection was that John was probably the most articulate in agitating for this uh, new way of of uh, dealing with computers, uh, namely trying to get more interactive. My exposure to Whirlwind had been always on the unclassified side, so I didn't know about the Sage stuff, although I had some hints. But certainly the notion of being able to get your hands on a computer was part of my background. So uh, trying to make interactive computing accessible was certainly something that made sense. And when the actual thoughts began to gel in the form of some of the early uh, memos that John wrote, uh, and then later Strachey, which I remember John called my attention to, Strachey's memo, or paper actually, uh, it seemed more and more obvious, and to myself and everybody else in the circle at the time. And uh, in fact, as we began to start a set of committees to try to do something in an organized way, and it was out of that set of committees that uh, we each began to uh, look for what we could do. Uh, John alluded to some of his attempts uh, 
I can still remember. <coughs> Dean Arden had a plug that was all set to support John's uh, Flexo Rider connection, but that's as far as that got, I think. Uh, I started on a quick and dirty version of time sharing, which was supposed to be uh, more of a demo system, which it later got called the Compatible Time Sharing System, CTSS. We'll probably come back to that. Uh, and uh, we were off and running, and I think. I mean, kind of. I think that's probably a good place to stop because we'll pick it up from there. I'm sure. Go ahead, Bob. Well, my story is a little bit longer, simply because I come from further away, <laughs> <laughs> and I was born uh, in Torino, Italy, and uh, I did uh, four years of engineering school there, uh, and I started. I, I was going into electrical engineering, uh, but in Italy, the uh, engineering is a five-year program, and the specialization comes only in the fifth year. So when I came over here in uh, 1939, I still really had a full year of work to do before I could... Uh, get a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and I started MIT in 19, February 1940 and finished, got my bachelor's in 1941. Uh, the, uh, the question is, why did I go into electrical engineering? I really don't know. As far as back as I can remember, I wanted, always wanted to be an electrical engineer and I have no idea why. I must, so I became an electrical engineer. I must also say that there was another thing that was uh, very clear to me. It was that I didn't want to be a professor. <laughs> he said, I am a professor, <laughs> and I have been a professor. Um, because of strange reasons, I will get into it. Well, when I graduated in 19, for, February 1941, I looked for a job. And it was practically impossible for me to get a job. And the reason why is that the, I was still an Italian citizen and the, essentially the whole electrical industry in the United States was already beginning uh, to do military work. So a clearance was necessary, which I could not get. So I ended up with, to work for General Motors in a Fisher body plant in Grand Rapids. And uh, without spending time on that, I really didn't like that job. And then I remember that uh, Carlton Tucker, who was was uh, executive officer of the department, had offered me a teaching assistantship when I graduated. And I had said no, because I was not interested in a teaching career. So I got in touch with him and told him that at that point I was interested. To make a long story short, I started as a teaching assistant in September 1941, and I have moved from MIT since. Uh, now, how did I get eventually into computers? Well, I, I, I'd been a film hopper uh, from the very beginning. Uh, First of all, in teaching, uh, because of the war, since most of the faculty of the electrical engineering department disappeared, uh, I was asked to do as teaching assistant things that were unheard of, uh, like being in charge of a graduate course after two years that I had been a teaching assistant in microwaves. Uh, I had taught all sorts of things, uh, electronics for communication, uh, uh, microwaves. And then in 1944, finally they opened the door to the radiation laboratory for non-citizens. So I moved to the radiation laboratory where I was, what was being called a microwave plumber. And uh, at the end of the radiation laboratory, I was one of the founding research associate and graduate student of RLE. Uh, I got finished my doctor in June '47, and I went on in the faculty. Now, after getting my doctorate, and my thesis was in, in network theory, uh, so I had been in microwave and network theory by then, I got interested in information theory that was uh, a <coughs> field for more than a decade. 
um, then uh, now that got me in the direction of computers in a certain sense and I remember that in the uh, around 1960 um, I got involved into computer affairs simply because there was a great scarcity of uh, senior faculty, I was a full professor by then, uh, that I had any connection whatsoever with computers. So, for instance, when a committee was set up to look at the future of computation, chaired by Philip, or was Al here? No, you? I started. Yeah, the, the, I was asked to be a member of that committee. I knew practically nothing about computers. Uh, but another thing that I recall very well, that in my work in communication theory, I uh, became every, very evident in the late 50s that uh, the process of signal structuring, in particular the process of detecting signal in the presence of noise and decoding, involved very complicated and at that time, communication engineers were thinking primarily of decoding or detecting in terms of primitive hardware, prim hardware primitives, I'm sorry, like uh, an amplifier, an oscillator, a detector, and so forth and so on. And it occurred to me that since the computers existed, we ought to be thinking instead in functional terms. And any operation that was logically possible would eventually be possible to implement by means of a computer. This is what got me started. It so happened that in uh, 1961, I completed various things that I was working at. Uh, I completed my book in information theory. I completed the book on electromagnetic theory. It was the textbook for undergraduate. Uh, so happens also, uh, my doctorate student finished the thesis at that time, so I was a free bird, and I went on a sabbatical uh, at Lincoln Laboratory in the uh, academic year, 61-62. Uh, and I decided at that time that I had enough with information theory and communication theory that I wanted to get in the computer field. So when I came back in fall, uh, I had already arranged with Bob Gallagher to take over my graduate course in information theory, and I was ready to go when Project Mac happened. And probably I should stop at that point because we will talk about it. Uh, how essentially how I got into the computer field, not as a worker, but as an administrator. Probably I should stop at that point. Project Mac didn't just happen. Hmm? Project Mac just didn't happen. <laughs> well, I mean, the opportunity to, to, to start Project Mac came up. Okay. Perhaps I, I, I should say just a couple of words about it. Um, that fall, uh, Lick Lighter started coming around. MIT was at the uh, Brent uh, Yeah, we couldn't make it today. He because uh, Lick was at MIT in the immediate post-war period, and I knew very well that he went to Paul Veronica and Newman, and then eventually he got interested in computing, wrote a classic paper about man-machine symbiosis. He went to the Pentagon, essentially, to, to get that sort of movement started, <coughs> and it got funded by ARPA, and the started going around the country, uh, building up enthusiasm for man-machine interaction and timeshare. And of course, he came to MIT also. And uh, he was uh, quite anxious to get a big operation started at MIT. I recall he wanted to get a few centers of excellence, that's what he was calling them, set up in universities. And he wanted in particular one at MIT, and uh, it was quite clear that uh, the problem of getting such a thing started at MIT was serious. And the reason was that all the computer faculty were young at that time. Uh, John McCarthy was an assistant professor. You had just joined the faculty, or perhaps not even yet. <laughs> 
Marvin, I don't know why. He did. I'm sure that Marvin didn't have tenure yet. Uh, the only senior person involved with computing was Bill, who was director of the computation center and had his hands full because he also was doing a lot of other things. So it, it became immediately clear that if something was going to happen at MIT, it had to be pushed by somebody who was not a, a computer person, but came from a field sufficiently related to make some sort of a sense out of that. Well, I became quite interested in the matter, largely because of the uh, point of view that John McCarty had introduced. This was in the uh, lecture that he gave at the, what was the 50 years? Uh, uh, oh, that is in the book edited by Greenberg. Yeah. Management computer utility. Uh, yeah. Management in the computer. And computer. In the that is, what really appealed to me was the notion of a computer utility and all the implications that it had for a lot of things. So, essentially, the whole thing was decided in a week. And I, I think I want to mention the story because uh, it's typical of the sort of thing that were happening at MIT. Um, Nick kept talking with me and trying to get me hooked. And we were together at a meeting uh, organized by MITRE down in Virginia, the homestead, and we talked a lot. We talked a lot on the train coming back. And it was the day before Thanksgiving. And I kept thinking about it, and on Thanksgiving Day, I decided I'm going to do it. What the heck? This is in what year, 62? That, that was 62, uh, on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, on Friday, in those days, and my tea was open the day after Thanksgiving, I had... Uh, an appointment with the provost who was Charlie Towns at that time because I was also chairman of the computer science committee. Uh, and I had to talk with him about it. And I told him about the idea. And I said, well, I said why don't you think about it? Let me know what you think. Said, that's something you should do. And he said, oh yeah, that's a good idea. Go ahead. <laughs> so <laughs> over the weekend, I wrote a two-page memorandum outlining what I had in mind, <coughs> on Tuesday I met with Jay Stratton, who was president of MIT at that time, and the main question that he asked me was, where are you going to do it? Uh, because as Phil Morris said at that time, MIT was caught with his buildings down. <laughs> and uh, I, by then I had heard that the eighth of a ninth floor of the new technology square building that was not up yet had been leased by CIR and CIR wanted to get rid of that lease because they weren't doing so well. Uh, so I told Jay Stratton, I heard this and uh, maybe we can get that space and he said, fine. And then on Thursday, Lick Lyon had already plans to come to MIT from Washington and we all met in Jay Stratton's office and kind of informally agree that that was going to happen. So it was a week span, essentially, the decision in principle was made. And that's <laughs> Let me <laughs> ask you one way. question. Yeah. Some, somewhere along that line, and yeah. I'm interested to know where, uh, you, hit, you met me in the hall. Yeah. I think it was in the corner of Building 6. And you said, look, this project is is going to get started. Aren't you going? To, aren't you? Don't you want to be a director? The director. That's right. And I said no. That's and you right. said why? And I told you. And you sort of giggled and said thanks and went off. Yeah. Well, I think this was probably before. The, the, yeah. the, the Was at the time when I felt that something ought to happen. Yeah. And obviously you were the right person to do yeah, it. You, so I asked you. <laughs> let me add another slight footnote. Yeah. Lick came up. There were several meetings when Lick yeah. first approached us. He came up to MIT, and there was about a dozen people in the in a room. It was in the old uh, uh, Bush room, uh, and uh, I can still recall the meeting where everyone sort of said what was on their minds in response to Lick's inquiry, and it was kind of a cat and dog fight, and it sounded like a mess. And the result of it was that you came out of that meeting, Bob, saying, we can't do, we've got to do something about this. You were very appalled at the fact that we had such a disorganized front. And uh, I think that was the actual point where you 
first began to seriously think about doing something? Well, it, it really, the critical time was when I was down at this meeting in uh, Yeah, well, that's in Virginia, jail, but, yeah. Uh, because I became clear of what a mess the information processing field was at the time. Right. Uh, and that something had to be done to try to think through the issue or something about it. Of course, I was already familiar by then with the, with all the work on, 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 uh, on time sharing. <coughs> I had been influenced by John and so forth and so on. Uh, so, the yeah, whole, I, you know, it seems to me that it, it, all of, it, it's very hard to recreate the incredible arrogance and rigidity that the manufacturers had already taken on. Yeah. <laughs> and that was one of the reasons why we had to get organized. Right? Only matched by our own. <laughs> well, maybe so, but uh, why don't we keep going around? <laughs> because we'll yeah. get into yeah, a I'll, long I'm, I'm going to touch on that, too. Well, you finished? Yeah. Cool. So I'm, I'm a little bit out of place here because I never have been a a computer specialist, either for hardware or software. But as a physicist, and later as, as uh, someone interested in operations research, I've always been interested in the use of computers and, and got more and more uh, convinced that somehow or other every person going through a technical school, and eventually any college, ought to know something about computing. I started way back pre-war, got my bachelor's degree at Case under Dayton Miller in the 20s, went on to Princeton, got my doctor's degree there in physics. Finished my thesis in a couple of years and then spent my last year. You couldn't get a doctor's degree in two years at Princeton then. Spent my last year helping Ed Conan write a text on quantum mechanics. And I came up to MIT at the time that Compton moved from Princeton up to MIT and been in the physics department ever since until, well, I still got an office down in the physics department. But very early, I got interested in computers because the work we were all doing in quantum mechanics got more and more complicated and needed more and more computing. So two of my papers that were published during the 30s were based on some work that I did with the Bush Differential Analyzer. Then during the war, when I was down in Washington working with the Navy, I think my group introduced the first computing equipment to the Navy. It was a straight punch card equipment with a sorter and so forth. We did a lot of statistical work on it, kept a great deal of data on it, reported on all of the <coughs> contacts with submarines, with German submarines in the Atlantic on it, and reported every morning to uh, Admiral King's staff. A question. Yes. Did you know anything about the electronic computing that was going on for cryptographic I purposes? knew nothing. I was too, too very much busy at that time. Matter of fact, I didn't get in contact with anybody working in the digital computer line until I came back to MIT in the, I think it was 51 or 50, when I started talking to, to Jay Forrester. No, I was, I was uh, convinced that we needed computing, but I knew very little about what the, what the developments were, were going on. When I got back to MIT, I soon began talking to Jay Forrester he was, of course, very busy designing and building Whirlwind. But my interest was to get students, to start with graduate students, 
all around the Institute, acquainted and familiar with computing. And the more I talked to Jay, this was, of course, secondhand, because I wasn't doing any work along that line. The more I talked to Jay, the more I got convinced that, that the digital way was the way to go. Uh, I can remember some very strong arguments I had with Van Bush. <laughs> Van was quite convinced that digital computers were the wrong way to go. I remember very well uh, that in the point of Project Mac, you suggested that the fall that we should have launched with Van Bush. Mm -hmm. And we had launched the two of us with them at the faculty club. Yeah. And I was completely flabbergasted yeah. Yeah. by the powerful emotion yeah. that the word yeah, Van against digital computers. And then it came clear that what he meant by digital computer was binary computers. He didn't mean discrete. And he was perfectly willing to buy. And in fact, he said there was a lot of need for computation. Uh, but he had in mind something other than binary and can never, could never understand why, in particular, he was against binary computers. Oh. Unless it had to do with some early history or argument with... Uh, I think so. With um, uh, Norbert Wiener, was that it? Well, I don't know whether it was no. Norbert Wiener or not, but it, it certainly was. Was uh, no, it was. He didn't like to. I talked to him before Project Mac as part of the study. Yeah, and his hatred of binary was as an engineer. He didn't like the idea of using ten ones and zeros to represent something he could do with three decimal numbers. That was it. That was it. That was it. But there was really and powerful I don't think emotion I tried to explain to him that, you know, we can make a converter yeah. for you. There were <clears throat> a, you know a terribly powerful emotion behind it. Yes. That really I could not justify on the basis of plain well, technical Well, historically, it was, it was, was, was von Neumann uh, snowed him at one point. Uh, in other words, there, there was something, somewhere. there was something about... Uh, he felt uh, he lost out during the war. I mean, he, he built up this very complicated differential analyzer with vacuum tubes and so on, which was in the middle of, yeah. of MIT. <laughs> and it never did anything. And it, he felt that, that people just passed it by and didn't pay any attention to it. And I, that I think was the reason. Uh, well, part of it. Do you know of his work in trying to build a digital uh, base four computer in about 1938 to 39 with Radford and Holden? Um, this is the Rockefeller. No, before no. the Rockefeller oh. There was there was, was a, 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 a computer yes. project yeah. in the E department yeah. just before World War II, and Radford, among others, was involved. Truman Gray also had some slides. Sam Caldwell. Sam Caldwell. Sam Caldwell. Mm -hmm. uh, I found out about it from Carl Walls right up. Yeah. And uh, he it, it, it was focused primarily, <coughs> as I call now, in the development of a vacuum tube that would do the switching. Yeah. And, uh, of course, the project was stopped at the beginning of World War II. It was restarted, according to Carl, uh, in the immediately after World War II. And then the Hazen, who was the department head at that time, came to the conclusion with the people involved that there was no point in having a computer project in the department on a, essentially a shoestring support when there was whirlwind next door uh, going on with the millions of dollars of funding. So it was stopped and Hazen returned to the sponsor, it was a foundation of some sort, well, a check uh, for the balance of the unexpended money, and probably that <laughs> it might have been the last time that they might return any money <laughs> to a sponsor. Anyway, when when uh, second, what was the year of that luncheon that you talked about? With uh, that was the fall sixty two. Yeah. Just the decision yeah. to go ahead with Project Mac had been yeah. made, yeah. and I was in the planning stage, and I had a lot of contact with Phil at that time, and he made that suggestion, yeah. which was. Yeah. But I talked. I talked to Van much earlier and, and got some of that feeling. Of course, 
we were reasonably close back in the 30s when I worked with, with, with his machine. Anyway, coming back to Whirlwind, uh, after wasn't much more than six months uh, that I, after I arrived, I, I became convinced that something had to be done to, to make most of MIT aware of, of digital computers, of computers in general, and uh, whirlwind was the obvious. Uh, Forrester admitted, a little grudgingly, that uh, there was some spare time, and that people could could uh, come and and use the machine when when they weren't busy building. <coughs> so I went down to my friends in, in uh, the Navy, ONR, and said, "Look, why don't you add a little bit to the whirlwind funds for to set up a a a set of." of uh, research assistants uh, to use Whirlwind, and I'll set up a committee at MIT, and we'll appoint uh, research assistants uh, in as many departments as, as are willing to, to, to take them. My feeling was that the only way you were going to get faculty interested and in using computers was to get a graduate student under their direction uh, using computers. So ONR agreed, and I forget when it was 53 or 54 or something like that, when the first assistantships were available. Was no, it, was, it was earlier. Was it uh, earlier? Oh, yeah. It was, uh, yeah. I, I started it was. summer 51. I was in the, really? I was uh -huh. the first crop. Well, and then it went faster than I thought. Uh, anyway, we had somewhere between six and eight assistant ships all spread around. There were, some, there were a couple in physics, and there were a number in math, and there were a number in, in uh, the various electrical in, uh, engineering departments, and uh, one or two in... in uh, economics even, somewhere along the line. Uh, so things began to build up, but it was obvious that, that <coughs> very soon the available time of, in Whirlwind was going to be saturated and something would have to, had to be done. So I don't know, I can't remember how I got acquainted with Cuthbert Hurd in IBM, uh, somewhere along in the <coughs> early 50s, he started to visit here. And I was telling him some of the complications. And one of the things that uh, I kept pressing on him was the point that the first computer manufacturer that installs a, uh, a machine in, in a place like MIT was going to have a great advantage in, in selling machines after these graduates got out. Your and book says that um, you hmm? got acquainted with Cuthbert Hurd through Fortran. Is that correct? Could be. Could be. Mrs. or Mr. Fortran is another, another story. Says IBM persuaded to I vaguely remember that, that the that the whirlwind people were very much against uh, compilers. Fortran in particular was, was being developed then. Because it was going to use a lot more of computer time. They had to run a problem through twice. First to compile and compile and then, then to then to run the problem. And uh, the old timers didn't like this. They made well, it we, true of some of them, but not all. No, that's yeah. that's true. Yeah. There were there were a number of them that that, that and took part how in. And quickly, it. they became old timers after about ten <laughs> years. <laughs> as, I recall, as I recall, Corby in fifty one, didn't Charlie Adams have a summer thing, and a couple of his people, Sheldon something or Sheldon other, Best, put together an algebraic compiler, and then mm -hmm. by the time I came back to MIT. 
55, I heard rumors they'd gone to MIT to work on Fortran. Yeah, well, there was. Yeah. Yeah. We had a session on that here. Yeah, maybe Sheldon did do something. Uh, of course, Hal Lanning was the one that did it in the yeah. instrumentation lab, did the early uh, algebraic uh, interpreter. Did he, was he at Fortran? Uh, no, too? The, he never got related to the. He was. He did work. He just stayed within the Draper orbit and continued to work up compilers for them. Lanning was here, and it's sort of an interesting story. Uh, quickly, because it's a diversion, really, but you'd be interested. He developed a compiler. And he's so good at assembly language, which he still is to this day, he just never trusted the compiler. Yeah. And um, he, he, when he was sitting here, he said he still doesn't trust compilers. It's much easier to do with the assembly language if you pushed it. And so you get that kind of personal thing. But they did do it around 54, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there, there are always some people that have clung to the, the, yeah. the, the, the details. Uh, but, uh, no, shall. Phil's basically right. I, I don't quite know how the liaison got started, but but uh, MIT had Sheldon, and wasn't there another one other yeah. person? Yeah, there yeah. was somebody. Uh, and I don't. And the Sheldon uh, was part of that original. The from MIT. No, there was another MIT person. Uh, Sheldon was part of that original team, and it was the one that uh, got involved in the index register opt optimization, which uh, became a monument to obscurity. <laughs> in the sense it was very effective and uh, people never understood it for about five or ten years until about five or ten years later uh, <coughs> how he did how they did it because they didn't write it up very well <coughs> at all and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but it was uh, one of the key things. anyway Cuthbert I guess managed to persuade the, the top people at IBM that something had to be done and the next thing I heard was that Jim Killian called me in and said uh, uh, that he understood that Watson wanted to donate a, a big computer to, to MIT, and because uh, he was mad at Harvard. <laughs> so uh, that's essentially the way the, the uh, thing got started. MIT was building the Compton Building. What is it? Twenty Building Twenty Six. Twenty Six. Yeah. Right. And uh, the dicker was that IBM would pay for some additional amount of the building, plus a, a hunk that stuck out the side that, that was going to be the, the housing, the place for the computer. So we had a lot of arguments as to how the thing was installed and how, how to cut down the noise on the, on the air conditioning and all the rest of the stuff, but it got in. And in the in the meantime, IBM was willing to donate additional money for research assistants, <coughs> both at, at MIT and at New England universities, a dozen each, I believe. So I had to I had to set up committees, both in inside MIT and uh, with the related. Colleges. I don't know. Was that the time that you got that you got acquainted with the fact that we were going to get a, a, a computer, or had you heard about it earlier? Uh, I became acquainted with it when two IBMers. All I remember is that they were two tall men in dark suits. <laughs> <laughs> one of them was Truman Hunter, and mate, the other one was either Cuthbert Hurd or Nat Rochester. I've forgotten which, but I think it was probably Rochester. Came up to MIT to. I uh, came up to Dartmouth to sell this concept, uh -huh. uh, and uh, their main contact was John Kemeny. Yeah. And but then I went to lunch with them, and uh, became acquainted with Rochester and rang him about something. I suppose it was AI, and he offered me a summer job, which I took. So I was at, uh, IBM in the summer of '55, and then I became, I guess, Dartmouth's representative. Yeah, to this you thing. did. Well, that was my first acquaintance. Yeah. At any rate, when we got going, uh, sometime in, in 57, I believe, the, the machine got in, we began to roll, and uh, the machine very soon got overloaded, of course, uh, as more and more people began to use it, and as more and more faculty began to learn what could be done. Uh, it wasn't very long before 
these ideas that you and you, you two began to percolate, the idea of interactive work. Herb Teeger was in some of this, this early work too. And uh, <coughs> I started talking about it to IBM. Well, they weren't interested. This was one of these fancy, long-haired university sort of things that uh, would, would never get off the ground. And they were perfectly willing for us to play around with it, but first were not at all interested in, in helping out with additional equipment. It soon became quite obvious that in order to get very far, we had to have more memory anyway. I would add, add a footnote that you know, there was very little recognition in those days of the rapid obsolescence that would characterize computing equipment. And I, I can still recall a kind of uh, battleship. Uh, in those days, there were no false floors. And the original computer floor was steel, maybe a quarter, half inch, or maybe half inch steel plate, which uh, a welder would come in and with a cutting torch, make a hole for cables to go down underneath the floor. Mm -hmm. It was a gigantic construction project to lay out the machine room. And every time you wanted to change the machine room, you had to get new, either new steel plate or weld up the holes. <laughs> it was really wild. And then you had persuaded them over this noise issue that they should customize the the airflow on each yeah. of the units so that, in fact, they were ducted directly from the plenum rather That's than right. all of the internal fans were taken out much to, against IBM's. IBM yeah. objected pretty hard to it yeah. because it, yeah. and uh, we'd never do that ever again, but, but it, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Yeah. Well, it quieted things. Yeah. <coughs> it also led to silver migration because our air conditioning unit was... Uh, this is really a footnote on a footnote. Our air conditioning unit was was uh, the usual crude affair, and we got excessive moisture condensation around the terminal strips of the 704, <laughs> and it turned out that due to a, a, a design a, a production flaw or the, back at IBM, which they didn't really find out about until about two or three years later, they somebody had substituted uh, silver for as a contact material, and that led to a phenomenon which was well known in the research literature, but the production people didn't understand, uh, that the silver ions would migrate across the, the, the uh, insulation and proceed to form a high-resistance bridge, which would lead to shorting and signal failures and so forth. And about the time we shipped out that 704, it was just about ready to be scrapped anyway because uh, it, we were getting silver migration problems everywhere. Yeah. Well, uh, my my problem at the time was was to keep up with the with the demand for computing, and at the same time help out as much as I c could by by uh, persuading IBM to add equipment as as needed. And uh, I felt myself a little bit between two hard rocks. Uh, I guess I can jump ahead and let the rest of you fill in in between. About the time that Mac got started, of course, there was a general feeling that IBM was not the manufacturer to help out with time sharing because they'd been pretty much against it right right along the whole Time. More complicated than that. Yeah, I know. Okay. You, you, <laughs> and so when the final decision was made to, to get a, a GE machine for the Mac, I was the one that got it in the, in the, in the neck. Uh, I got called in by, I know, I, I guess, I forget the guy's name, head of, of uh, IBM for New England. Oh, Bradley. Phil Bradley. Bradley. Yeah, Phil, Phil Bradley. Bradley. Yeah. Came in and gave me the worst dressing down I have ever had. Uh, I MIT know about was, that. MIT I know was, about was uh, just didn't have any conscience or 
Harvard had betrayed any the gratitude now toward, toward a, a company that had befriended the Institute for so long. We went out of our way to, to rub IBM's nose in the dirt. It took about a half hour before I had a chance to even say thank you or, or goodbye. Well, IBM um, in those days would punish people. Badly. Yeah. Financially. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what happened to Brad? Uh, he survived a few more years. Uh, With the account in Thule, Alaska. No but the person that really caught it was Lauren Bullock, who had been the Bullock. IBM yeah. University yeah. representative, well, yeah. and who had been one of our staunchest yeah. uh, friends yeah. in trying yeah. to help us. And they, of course, in standard fashion, punished him the worst. Yeah. Very, very, why, why don't we go on to yeah. her because yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think so. uh, there are many things in this conversation yeah. which yeah. are co which I would consider to be quite inaccurate. And, uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, but let's sort of go through the yeah. preliminary part first. Herb, you're on. Okay. Uh, one, one footnote uh, or aside before I start. This is 20 years ago. And as Bob Pano pointed out, we were awfully goddamn young, and we were awfully insecure, and we didn't know each other very well, truth be known. I've heard John and Corby say things about their background I never knew, and I rather suspect there are things in my background they never knew. We right. never got to be friends, and that's a pity, because I think Computing and time sharing and the whole Megilla might have gone off in a different direction if we hadn't been quite so pitted against each other. There had been a little more of a vector dot product. Be yeah, as it may, I was born in Ohio. I matriculated high school in Brooklyn, New York. I was a real pain in the ass. Uh, I was a hot shot. I won a Westinghouse as a... Uh, senior and figured I was one of the smartest kids in the country. I came to MIT convinced of one thing. I did want to be a professor. My dad had tried the industrial route and I watched him bleed a little bit too much. And I thought there was such a thing as an ivory tower. And I couldn't decide what I wanted to be. I, so I solved the problem by tripling in electrical engineering, physics, and chemical engineering. One of my dad's good friends was a chemical engineer. Uh, my friend.